First of all, I'm really looking forward to actually speaking to him live. Please welcome to the stage Anand Gerdadas. And now for something very different. <laughs> Anand, any sabbaticals coming up for you? Were you in one? I guess not. I gotta say, you know, the, it's so interesting. I've never followed um, such a relevant act before. <laughs> Correct. Um, you have... I mean, that was an incredibly eloquent and brilliant speaker. Yes. Um, with a very moving personal story. And I think I immediately started wishing that I had a lawyer that good. Um, but if this is a house of beautiful business, companies like Facebook should be shown the door, not given a stage. Um, I once spent half an hour talking to Jared Kushner at a party, and it made me realize that it's the smart, thoughtful people, which I would say he is, and maybe a painful thing to hear, but he is very smart. It's the smart, thoughtful people who go along with predatory structures, um, abusive structures, structures that are monopolies, that abuse privacy, that have no respect for our laws and democracy, that lie to legislative bodies all the time. It's the smart people who should know better. And I'm very, very uh, hopeful that this conversation about beautiful business is not just a conversation about business on its own terms becoming more beautiful, um, but frankly, business being forced to be less abusive and less predatory um, and frankly put in its proper place relative to democracy. You've actually called Facebook's... You've, you've called Mark Zuckerberg an authoritarian titan. If you were to take his seat for one week, how would you use that position of power? I would break up the company immediately. I would cease and desist from all lobbying. Act I mean, we, we heard a testimony about regulation allows companies to do a lot of bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, Facebook has more lobbyists than most companies on earth mm -hmm. um, and is active. I mean, I've met some of them. I have a lot of people who tell me what they do privately and not on stages and tell me that they're pushing for regulations that create the world in which Facebook can be predatory and abusive and which they're under-regulated. Um, and so I actually don't think Facebook in particular, if we're talking about a particular company, I actually don't think it's a redeemable company. Um, and I think there will be many people who create platforms for community. There already are many platforms. Frankly, I'd love companies founded in Africa to play that role. I don't think a guy who started a social network in 2004 because he like, couldn't meet people face to face and wanted to create a way to like, rate girls' beauty um, on a website, I don't think that person, um, having behaved the way he has since that day, and frankly, at the beginning also, um, should have the power over how so much human discourse, the power to affect elections, um, the power to allow foreign cyber war operations to go on unimpeded because the growth lust conflicts with letting regulators in or letting journalists in, the amount they've threatened journalists who've tried to actually look into some of the stuff we were talking about earlier. Um, so I think Facebook is, is, is beyond repair. And what's been really interesting, I've spent a lot of time over the last year speaking of different things like this, exactly set up like tonight where I talk and then I go to the line. Now the line, as you'll see, is not incredibly private, but it's more private than this. Mm -hmm. But it's not exactly a safe space. People can hear what's being said, maybe. I can't tell you the number of Facebook executives who have felt safe enough in the line, not here, to say our company is fucked up and Zuckerberg is the problem and has to go. So, so if I had that job, I would resign. <laughs> well, the reason why I ask about what you would do in that position of power is you've, you've said that you want to bring the language of power back into the, the public conversation, which is a public conversation that I understand you 
to consider to be dominated too much by what you call market world. Now, we're here at an event that is called Beautiful Business, the House of Beautiful Business. How would you describe market world to people who clearly care a little bit about business? Market world, so, so one of the things I learned a long time ago as a writer is that if you are writing the kind of book or article where you know, you're going to Antarctica and you're, telling, you're, you're describing something that most people will never see, have never seen, all you have to do is just straight up describe in straightforward words because it's a new territory for people. Then there's another kind of thing, which this book is, which is you are re-describing to people stuff they are intimately familiar with. This is a book about the slogans you hear all the time. It's about the companies we all work for. It's about the billionaires we see in the news every day. And so when you are doing that latter type of project, we, what you are trying to do is make people look again at what they already know, what they already think they've seen. And it's very important. Coinage is a very powerful tool to kind of reconstitute reality for people to maybe have people see it in a slightly different way. So I coined this term market world to try to describe a bunch of things that are disparate phenomena that I think are part of the same phenomenon. And this, the phenomenon is a, a, a kind of community network of people, an ideology guiding those people, that, that essentially says win-win. Doing well by doing good. Maybe even beautiful business. That, you can base, that we can basically live in a world in which we make the world better by the rich and powerful making as much money as possible and certainly never giving up power. That, that it is possible in an age of inequality an age of monopoly, an age of elite capture, that it is somehow magically possible to lift up those prostrated on the floor without somehow disturbing the people standing on their necks. Now, this is a remarkable feat of physics, let alone uh, ideology. And so market world is billionaires who, to, to go with something you said earlier, make their money actively by committing harm. I, I believe Facebook actually is in that category. Um, connecting the world is a slogan, it's not an activity. Um, and then do good works on the side to purpose wash, as you eloquently put it. Um, I believe it's also uh, young people who are not billionaires, who are 22 on college campuses deciding what to do with their lives. And I start, actually start the book with Hillary Cohen's story. She's, she's one of them, not famous, not a philanthropist. but determined to make a difference, as so many young people are now, determined to change the world, and who end up at Goldman Sachs and McKinsey because that's what they're now told is the way you acquire the skills to change the world. You, you apprentice with the people most responsible for uh, degrading uh, the conditions of the issue you want to work on. Um, I believe also there's a kind of circuit of thought leadership, which I write about in the book, um, the kind of Aspen, Ted, Davos world. How's where, a beautiful business? <laughs> maybe. I just got here, but I suspect that may be true. Um, where there's a lot of good content and a lot of good ideas, and there is a certain kind of intellectual boundary, oftentimes, that keeps out the kinds of ideas that people may not like to hear when they've paid two or eight or ten thousand um, dollars to get some ideas poured down their throat. Um, and so all these things are different. The billionaire is different than the 22-year-old is different than the idea circuit. But what they all have in common is, I believe, an explanation for why we're living in the age we are. Why, are we living, why is Donald Trump president? Why is Brexit happening? Why are the inequality numbers, even in European countries that do have better tax regimes, so bad? The Piketty's numbers on Europe are better than America, but not great. Why, 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 right? I think we all, the defining question I feel from people when I do events is like, why is this happening, right? Which is the name of Chris Hayes' podcast. Why is this happening? And my little answer to why this is happening is we have outsourced the reform. Most people agree we need transformational reform of our societies right now. We have outsourced the leadership of such reform to the people with the most to lose from actually changing anything. And I believe, and this book is a passionate plea, for taking change back uh, from people who deep down uh, have no incentive or desire or willpower um, to fight for the kinds of structural change that are going to see them be actually less wealthy, less powerful, and have less impunity. Now, you... <laughs> Now, 
you mentioned the idea of win-win situations. In August, the Business Roundtable, which is basically a lobbying group that uh, represents hundreds of the largest U.S. corporations, they issued this statement, basically proclaiming that the business of business is business, the Friedman 1970 um, slogan should no longer hold true by itself, that corporations should no longer just maximize profit, but they should actually sort of uh, also stand for a vague kind of goodness for society, for, for individuals. And some people might say that, you know, business is becoming more value-driven and considering that kind of impact, uh, that, that's a win-win situation, that that's a good thing. Are you optimistic, A, that that might actually happen with the corporations that the Business Roundtable represents, and B, what's the problem with that? Why do you have a problem with a company that follows its, its bottom line and yet also has a social impact? Um, get comfortable, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Um, <laughs> So in August, this, this statement comes out. You're right, and it was... You got a I, call. I would say it was billed as a historic statement. Page one in the New York Times, right? I mean, normally, you put out some press release saying you have a new opinion about something. The New York Times doesn't put it on page one. It was considered such a his historic statement that 180-some CEOs now understand what your five-year-old kid at home understands, <laughs> which is that, like, human beings matter. But it was a really big deal for these white guys to come to this understanding um, <laughs> that, um, you know. And I think there's like, a, like one or two women in that group, so that, that's nice, letting them in. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it may have been letting them in that actually led to this statement, probably. Um, so, so this thing, so this statement comes out, and it's immediately greeted as like, mm -hmm. wow. And you think like, what, what if we were this credulous about claims about the military or by the military or claims by senators and Congress people or by anybody else, right? Like. 180 companies just said a statement that they now pledge to factor in people. Um, are they now, is any of those companies, I immediately asked publicly, mm -hmm. any of these companies uh, planning to renounce a tax practice that they're currently using that they won't use next calendar year? Any of these companies plan to not lobby on some issue that they were currently lobbying for? Any, any. I didn't get any answers. But because I was quoted in the New York Times article announcing this thing, I did while on vacation in August, get a phone call, get an email which led to a phone call from Jamie Dimon. JP Morgan Chase, CEO. Runs the biggest bank in the world, but also runs this umbrella organization. So he's like the CEO of the CEOs in addition to running this company. And, you know, most people in this kind of position are like, let's talk off the record or whatever. But to his credit, or for whatever other reasons, he did not say that. So we had a half an hour spirited discussion that gets to the heart of why you can't outsource the job of hen protection to foxes. Um, so, I, so he said, well, you know, why are you giving this kind of quote to the New York Times? I mean, you know, you're skeptical. I was like, you know, well, what you've signed up for is like a pledge of voluntary virtue, win-win, right? Beautiful business, you might say. You've committed to have your businesses be more beautiful. But what's making that a requirement? He said, well, you know, regulation's counter. I mean, it's all the like, business bro, you know the guys with the vests that have their like VC firm written on the vest, like that guy. The same stuff that you always hear from those guys, right? Look, well, regulation's really counterproductive. Um, those guys all have the same voice too, which is say, remarkable. Are they really old, all of them? They literally all <laughs> yeah. have that voice, yeah. Um, um, like, it, it, I just find it actually really like sociologically interesting as a side tangent, like a lot of women work in business but manage to like not have like three talking points what from their voice, first year of the MBA actually. program about business, but somehow these guys are just like really stuck in like, you know, regulation's kind of productive and, you know, taxes just reward poor people. And uh, um, so, you know, I'm hearing like a lot of this from the most powerful CEO in America. Um, and I just kept pushing him on like, if you believe companies should treat people better, fantastic. Let's do a minimum wage. Like, let's do that for everybody. Let's like make it the law. Your bank tellers, other people. I said, you know, there are a lot of exploitative companies, whether or not you think yours is, on that list that signed this thing. There's people peeing in a bottle to work their shifts. It's been reported in the paper. And he said, I know, I know those CEOs. They're nice guys. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just don't like to work. Mm. Right? Okay. So people are keeping their life savings with this guy who thinks they don't like to work. Um, we talked about lobbying. Why don't you 
require any company in the business roundtable that is now duty bound to follow this statement that they're not going to befoul the planet and hurt people by running their businesses to lobby for a law. There's a, Elizabeth Warren has a plan, Bernie Sanders has other plans, Accountable Capitalism Act. The Accountable Capitalism Act is basically what they said in a statement as an actual fucking law. Right? It's like a law where you have to do the stuff they said they were going to do. Oh, no, 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 no. I can't police my companies. I mean, we're not a police force. And it just became very clear. And I've had other conversations like this with Paul Pullman and others, like, including the very woke CEOs, that at the end of the day, these people work for shareholders. And it's about time we all grew up and stopped expecting them to take care of us and started using democracy, which is an amazing tool to take care of ourselves. Now... <clears throat> Let me. Jamie's, Jamie's going to be your next interview, is that right? Yes, right yeah. after. Yeah, Jamie will Facebook be here right Facebook on, yeah. on Jamie, that's yeah. right. I wish. Um, let's pretend like they actually were about to um, do something about what they just announced. And there were actually these activities with positive impact. I have a feeling that you would still consider win win situations to be non existent. That the idea of doing the bad or maybe doing your company's main activity while also doing these, you know, announced uh, sort of niceties on the side, that that just doesn't fly with you. I, so my question is, you say elite generosity is the wingman of injustice. Is elite minus generosity, is that any better if they don't do any of this? Isn't this a first step? Might one say that? It's, it's a great question. It's a very important question. First of all, I don't want to say there's no win-win situations in the world. There's plenty of win-win situations, right? Uh, the, the, the concept of win-win arises from like basic economics and trade. Like, you know, if, if I want that jacket, because I, it's a really stylish jacket, um, and I'm willing to give you an amount of money for it that makes you happy, like we could do a trade and that might I, actually I be a win-win. Like that. We, uh, we, we worked that out at the, yes. the other room. Um, that's a win-win. What a win-win becomes problematic when it rises beyond someone selling a jacket or ice cream and rises to the level of the richest and most powerful people who have too much power in a given moment. That's not true at all moments in history. That's just, I'm talking about this moment in history. And it also was true of you know, Brahmins in India. And it was also true of the people in Downton Abbey living in that damn castle all by themselves. Right? <laughs> when you have particular moments in history where you have really insane distributions of power, which is what we're talking about, and I believe we are in one now, right? where a handful of people own as much wealth as the bottom half of humanity. In the United States, 49% of new income goes to the top 1%. We, we kind of know the data now. In such a moment like that, a Downton Abbey moment, we can call it for simplicity's sake, a win-win is essentially saying, let's solve the problem of five people being in the castle and owning all the land and the oppression of everybody else. Let's solve that in a way that is awesome for the people in the castle. And what you do if you game that out is you will actually not solve the problem. It, to do a win-win is to side with power when you have an unequal distribution of power. Uh, there's no win-win answer to the Me Too movement, right? Uh, yeah, you gotta deal with your rapists and assaulters, which is a certain number of people, but all men need to have less power and impunity in all the spaces we operate in to even begin to address that issue. I say this again and again, real change. <laughs> the nicest man on earth who has never done any of that stuff enjoys too much power and impunity in many of the spaces he operates in, right? Real change involves the loss of power. I'll say that again, real change involves the loss of power. It's easier to think about it historically than now. There was no way to end slavery in a way that was a win-win for the white planter class. There was no way to give women suffrage that wasn't diluting the power of a male vote. There was no way to get children's little fingers out of the factories without cutting the profit margins of factory owners. They were all the right thing to do. They were all done over the objection of many people who had power, and they were the right thing to do. Um, so to the question about generosity, I think it's a complicated question if, are we better off if people didn't do nice stuff? I mean, a, a version of this I often get is like, would you rather that we just buy a yacht? <laughs> so the obvious... Did not read First book, of all, you know, you know you're buying that yacht anyway. <laughs> Second of all, <laughs> and you're buying it in part because the Taxes. philanthropic the donation donations. gives you a tax deduction that yeah. we all pay for that allows you to buy the yacht. Um, 
tens of billion dollars a year in the US alone spent on that by regular people. Um, I think in most cases, obviously we'd be better off with rich people at least trying to do certain things if they have not made their money in a predatory way that is you know, manifestly being covered up, et cetera, right? Um, however, I think that is so obvious that it's worth suggesting that in a significant minority of cases, we might actually be worse off with them doing a good thing instead of buying a yacht, and here's why. The buying of the yacht allows us to see with great clarity <laughs> who they are, and our situation, and our distribution of wealth. It, it makes the situation clear. And clear situations don't necessarily favor awful power distributions. But when you spend that million on the shelter for girls instead of the yacht, if it's one or the other. A museum in New York, for example. What, star you know, what starts to happen, let's use a real example that, you, that you're alluding to, I think. The Sackler family, you're mm -hmm. making money on the opioid crisis, killing people in the hundreds of thousands of scale, ge genocide levels of death, hundreds of thousands of deaths, right? Then you're sprinkling all this money to art museums everywhere, right? First of all, you're killing people in all these rural areas. There's not a lot of media, not a lot of voice. I mean, it's everywhere, but it's a lot of rural, exurban areas, right? Where are you putting the art museums? Are you at least giving the art museums to the families of people being killed? No. You're putting the art museums in places where people like me and you live, right? Why? So we don't make documentaries about it, so we don't write stories about it, right? All the philanthropy the Sacklers did was in places where fancy media people and influential people lived, right? People with a lot of Instagram followers. Um, so you do that. You, you sprinkle this money. A couple things may happen. A, you may wash your name. I grew up in a city with a lot of Sackler wings. I literally did not know about the opioid crisis, but I knew about all their arts philanthropy. And I don't, I think I read the paper more than like most 16 year olds. Um, I didn't know about the other thing. Uh, so you are able to obscure your name in a way, and the New York State Attorney General made this point in their complaint against, her complaint against the Sacklers. She said that philanthropy allowed them to do the things that kept killing New Yorkers, right? So the do-gooding thing may buy you enough reputational room to keep doing something that may even involve killing people. Um, second, it tends to alter our collective conversation about change, right? So internet.org is a thing they did. By the way, they had the free basics as part of that, which is a very coercive program where they were telling people like, Facebook's the only way to get on the internet in some of these developing countries. Um, but a little bit of do-gooding might allow you to like maintain a monopoly and have better relationships with government officials who might otherwise come after you. Um, and, and finally, and in some ways the book is an attempt to start to push back against this a little bit, these elite gestures of do-gooding alter our collective conversation about what change even is. And so the discourse starts to change. And things that are actually good, like labor unions, start to sound bad because of who's getting platforms and who gets to write books. And things like charter schools, which are not as good as labor unions, start to sound good because of who has their back. And on the question of feminism and empowering women, an idea like Lean In, which is essentially trying to convince women that thousands of years of patriarchy is a posture problem. If women, <laughs> if, if women were to have reclined at a different angle, Oppression over. You, you have done I'm an really amazing, you just fought patriarchy right there. Uh, one shoulder at a time. Um, and then you got like real feminists pushing structural change and universal daycare, like things actually revealed through policy to actually empower women, but they're marginalized because they would make people like Sheryl Sandberg pay more in taxes. Um, you start to get in the situation where we might be better off with the yachts because we would actually probably come after these people and, and, and actually have the kinds of public policies that end plutocracy faster and more effectively than we do when we're all getting smoke screened. Let's stick to that idea of buying the yacht to sort of display your actual character. You were quite outspoken about the Jeffrey Epstein scandal, specifically because you were part of um, a jury of a, an award that MIT um, gives out. And 
you were very outspoken about the fact that all of the money that MIT and the Media Lab specifically had taken was specifically anonymous, right? Where do you draw the line of what is okay to take, what kind of money, and what is good enough money to take? Because obviously, just for context, MIT said, well, of course, we are, you know, we are fundraising, we're trying to do research, where this is also for scholarships, we do need this money. So, number one, is there a red line for which kind of money to take? And then what about the anonymity thing? You sort of alluded to that with the yacht. Yeah, first of all, this is such a good question, and this is actually, since I know there's a lot of people in this room who are capable of building things and doing things, unlike me, um, this is a great, I'm gonna suggest a great thing for someone to do, because this is a thing that needs to be done. There's not a quick answer to that question. This is something that needs to be studied. And I actually think we need a commission, and it should involve museums, university, anybody who fundraises mm -hmm. on that scale and feels that they're part of this issue of you know, being kind of drive-through reputational laundromats. Um, I think there should be a commission that should study this for a year and answer that question. Because my quick answer is there is a red line and there is some money you should never take no matter what because you are literally just enabling a child rapist in that case mm -hmm. to keep raping children by giving him the moral glow of MIT. Right? There is no way they should have ever taken that money or Harvard should have taken that money. Right? The difference between MIT and Harvard is like MIT got caught. Um, and so let's not forget Harvard. Um, and I think the Sackler money, the, and by the way now this is a non-controversial thing, museums that took it are now you know, ending the name or, or I don't know if they're giving money back or not. Um, so I think there's definitely a red line where there's just like under no circumstances. But to be honest, I think the interesting case, and, and then there's some money that like none of us may have any problem with, mm -hmm. right? We can call that the green line or whatever. I think, frankly, most of the interesting cases are in between the red and the green line. So if you take something like the Walton family mm -hmm. behind Walmart, I would definitely, I, am, I have huge problems with Walmart, the kind of labor practices, et cetera. But I'm not suggesting that it's the same as the Sackler family or Jeffrey Epstein. Let's be clear. I'm also not saying it's on that side of the green line where everything's fine. I do think we're going to live in a world in which that money's going to get taken, regardless of what I think. And I think there's probably circumstances in which it's fine to take it. The question is, and this is just not happening right now, there is a lot of choice around how you take it and around what you offer these people in return. And that's what this commission that I'm proposing needs to study. Um, so you could give them credit which helps with the reputation laundering, or you cannot. But there is an asterisk there of like, if you don't give them credit, is it anonymity that is shielding them? You know, so you have to be, that, that, again, this is why it's worth like studying for a year, it's complicated. Um, you, I, I do not think they should get tax deductions for things you're putting your, your name on a building. You're trying to you know, impress your fourth wife candidate, um, <laughs> and, 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 and you put the name in a building, you're deriving a benefit. Why, why am I working longer hours every year to subsidize your tax deduction for putting your name on a building to impress your fourth wife candidate? Um, so there's that question. I think there's the question of meddling. I mean, you remember Epstein. Epstein was not just someone who gave money. He was like coming around. You know, uh, what you guys do, you know? I think this science is good. I mean, he also at Harvard, he funded the Program on Evolutionary Dynamics, acronym PED. He funded the PED program at Harvard. Um, and, you know, there was this moment in the story that to me is the perfect encapsulation of your question and the answer, which is there was this moment in the MIT narrative story where a, an anecdote where Epstein had come around to the lab, I don't know, some years ago, and had been accompanied, as he often was, by these like very young women um, whose presence seemed a little weird given the fact that it was a visit to a lab. Um, and a bunch of women who worked in the lab thought there was a reasonable possibility that those women were being trafficked. In other words, were not like free slaves, essentially, in the lab. And these women who work at MIT, like got together on the side, according to this story, and were like, if we have a moment where he is separated from these women, we could rescue them. So noble that they had that conversation. I would just say, maybe don't raise money from people 
if you suspect that you might need to rescue their sex traffic slaves during a lab visit. May, like, maybe just don't take that money. Maybe. What do I know? Now, so one thing you just suggested is a commission. This is one particular issue. And you offer a lot of, especially in your book, you offer a lot of explanations. You offer a lot of catharsis, quite frankly. I'm wondering, even though I also sense a very strong warning against quick solutions in your book and, and sort of easy fixes, I do wonder about the, the sort of answer, right? Is the answer just tax them more, let politics do all? Is the answer vote for Elizabeth Warren? Is the answer sack all the CEOs? What do you actually propose? Um, I propose a return to democracy as the place we go to change the world to solve our biggest shared problems. Now, I want to be very clear, because I think I'm misunderstood on this count, and as I think you know, people like much more prominent in this conversation, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and others are misunderstood on this count. Like, I don't think even Bernie Sanders has proposed the nationalizing of a single corporation in America, right? Like, all we are talking about in this conversation is on the biggest shared problems we have, that problems at a scale where individuals are too powerless on their own to fight them, that those things, uh, those kinds of shared problems become the subject of public, democratic, institutional, and universal solutions, okay? So I'm very happy for my phone to be made privately. But I do not think the racial wealth gap or the legacy of slavery and segregation and, 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 and mass incarceration in America can be remedied by rich people throwing coins at black people. I just don't think that's true. Any more than I think Sheryl Sandberg's lean-in circles um, can, can deal with patriarchy. I think when you're talking about, the, and, I'm, and I'm specifically talking about those types of problems mm -hmm. that are the reason we have government, right? Like, the whole point of government, most things in life are solvable down here. Most things. It's a very small fraction of things that are not solvable on our own. And that's why we have government. And we have lived under an ideology for 30, 40 years, emanating out of the United States, but spread many places, um, that has told us government is bad. Government is bad. Government is the enemy. Government is slow. Government is inefficient. Government doesn't know how to regulate. Government is just giving your money to undeserving people. And I think many of us who are not really intellectually sympathetic to that idea in its core form have nonetheless inhaled the secondhand smoke of that idea. Mm -hmm. So that Ronald Reagan says, government is the problem. Bill Clinton says, the era of big government is over. That's the left version mm -hmm. of the same idea. Um, so my solution is a return to politics. And what that means practically is everybody in this room has some issue in your society or some three issues or 10 issues that you care about, things that piss you off about your community. I hope you do. And if you do, what I am suggesting very simply is next time you think about doing something about it, do not go into this door that we've been told to go into for the last 30, 40 years, which is the door of market win-win, doing well by doing good solutions. Do not solve that problem by selling cupcakes that give back. Do not solve that problem by getting BlackRock, persuading BlackRock to start an impact investment fund. Do not solve that problem by reading Ray Dalio's book. Do not solve that problem uh, by you know, having a shoe sent to some poor country for every shoe that you wear. I've been to many developing countries. I've never seen those other pairs of shoes, by the way. Um, <laughs> Um, if we have any investigative reporters here, see me afterwards. <laughs> and in the other door, in the other door is organizing, is fighting for laws and policies that will actually solve these problems at the root for everybody. And if in a space like this, your role is not just that of a citizen, organize, get involved, that's kind of obvious. It may be that you are part of institutions right now that are actively complicit in that not being a viable way for us to solve problems. You might be part of organizations that are lobbying against the government doing, you know, the government doesn't not solve stuff because it loves to not solve stuff. You, like, I know through my job, a lot of senators and congresspeople, do you know that how 
boxed in they are by these lobbyists who threaten them all day long with campaign contributions and getting kicked out of office if they don't stick in the amendment that's going to help Facebook. So first of all, it may be worth, if you're one of these, in one of these institutions, unwinding your complicity. Right? I have a feeling a lot of letters of resignation will be written tonight and, <laughs> after and, this and, conversation. And, like, and, I, and, I, you know, it, and it may be in some cases, I think Facebook's a good example, where there's just no hope in a particular organization and resigning is the moral thing to do. But I do think most organizations would benefit from people who are willing to think differently. I'll give you one example of something that's very moving to me. I said something about, at, at an event for you know, business and social responsibility types of, of folks, and maybe many people in the room who do that kind of thing. I said, you know, all of you, it's like, it was like the clean water person at Coca-Cola was right before me, so maybe that was a similar setup to today. Um, and people who did the good thing within each of their companies, right? And I said to this group, I don't doubt that what each of you do in this room is actually probably good for the world, net net. I don't doubt that you're the, I mean, maybe the clean water person is like dumping sludge, in, but I, I think probably what she does is net good. I was like, the problem is you have a colleague who you may know or you may not know, who probably has a nicer suit than you, lives in Washington DC or London or whatever, who is slipping things into federal budgets, putting things into trade agreements, that is hurting way more people on a much bigger scale than your lovely initiative is going to do, right? Um, and this guy comes up to me afterwards and he said, you know, that really, that really changed my life. And I said, where do you work? He works at a big pharmaceutical company, one of the biggest in the world. He's not, he probably doesn't agree with 90% of what I say, but he connected with that. Mm -hmm. And so he said, here's what I did. This is a senior guy. He was the head of the good stuff, sustainability or that, you know, that like big top three or four, you know, probably at this company. And he said, it never occurred to me that I'm being undermined by my own colleagues. And you're right, like any, anything slipped in the federal budget of the United States or a trade agreement or a WTO accord on drugs obviously is operating on a much bigger scale than anything the sustainability arm of my company is doing. He said, so I actually went down to Washington. And he's like, I'm a senior guy, so I could, you know, I could ask to go meet these people. And I met them. And he's like, you were right. They were doing all kinds of stuff that were completely undermining everything I work for every day. And I don't like that. And I've started to have conversations with them about harmonizing that. So you may hear me as someone who's, who's talking about, as, as I am, democratic solutions being the only fundamental solutions to that, and that's what I believe. But if you are in organizations like that, think about that guy. That is a thing you can do. There's versions of that you can do on tax day. Why do we pay no taxes? It's interesting, boss. We pay no taxes. That's kind of weird, right? <laughs> Have that conversation. Do you right. think that's going to change boss, though? I'm still wondering, because you are also, you're not just talking about corporations, you're also talking about billionaires, you're talking about individuals who, as you said and made very clear, will have to give up a lot of power. What kind of incentive could you possibly think of for them to have to change? Why should they? I, I think my suggestion that people ask the bosses nicely is like that moment in weddings where you're like, if anybody knows a reason why this couple should not get together, <laughs> speak now. Like, you're not really hoping or thinking that that's gonna happen, but it's important procedurally to give people the opportunity. <laughs> so like, I feel like we should give these CEOs a theoretical opportunity to like, hey, if you like want to start paying your taxes before the pitchforks come or the wealth tax comes, you should, that, now's the time. Hey, if you wanna actually, drop your opposition to the Accountab Capitalism Act and fight for it, even though you're a billionaire, now's a great time. And like, give them a chance to do that. And I've been trying to give them a chance to do that for a year. I don't know that I have any signups. Actually, that's not true. In the last year, the one thing where I have seen movement is you do now have, and I've talked to many, some of these people I know, some of them I do not know, I just read about, there are some billionaires who have started to advocate, not just for higher income taxes, which was always an easy thing because they don't have a lot of income, um, you know, if you're that rich, you can arrange to not have income. Um, they've started advocating for wealth taxes, right? Which was considered vaguely communist in, in this country mm -hmm. until pretty recently. In, not this country, but the United yeah. States. Communism's fine here. Um, <laughs> and um, I see the signs everywhere, man. It's like a, it's like a Bernie rally on crack out here. Um, um, and, and, and I think... I do not count on any of those people to lead the bandwagon. What I think 
those who are doing that, um, and it's, it's, it's an impressive group of people, what they are doing is rendering their fellow plutocrats, or plutes as I call them to save time, re rendering their fellow plutes ridiculous, publicly rendering them ridiculous, right? They are stripping off the clothes of these private emperors because they are admitting, right? Alexis Ohanian who started... Um, Reddit. Sorry. What? Reddit. Reddit, right, right. And now is much more famous for being Serena Williams' husband. Um, he had this great line when the wealth tax discussion first came out, right? People were like, you know, if, if, if this 2% wealth tax on north of $50 million um, goes through, like, I will never start a business again, blah, blah, blah. Right? The, the guys with the vests and the voice. Um, and Alexis Ohanian did this great tweet. Me in whatever year he started Reddit, me in 2003, whatever it was. You know, ah, I was about to start this company, but a wealth tax just passed, so I'm going to not start this company now, right? Like, said no one ever, right? And part of what I want to do is actually play poker with these guys, right? I want to play poker with these guys. We're going to move to Singapore if you pass a wealth tax. We're going to move our company somewhere else. We're going to leave Britain if you pass this tax. We're, you know what? Let's, let's, let's play. Let's play. You know what? You know why I don't believe you? Because you actually benefit. You who threaten us by leaving New York for Florida or leaving America for Singapore. You who threaten us all day long benefit more than almost any of the rest of us from the amazing democratic societies we have built. And you are leeches on those societies by benefiting from them, benefiting from them, and undermining them all day, every day, and threatening us that if we pass policies to maybe give people health care, maybe give people education, maybe empower people uh, who have dealt with historical injustices, that you are going to leave, well, go. <laughs> Now, before we run out of time, which we already have, I do have to say, when I got to the end of your book, I couldn't help but feel like the very end should have really been at the beginning. You have these acknowledgments that you might as well have called disclaimers, because you very openly say you went to a very nice private school, you went to Harvard, you worked for McKinsey, you spoke at TED, you spoke at Aspen, you are part of a lot of the circles that you critique, at least you were part of Virtually them. all of them. Virtually all of them, actually. And to be honest, at the very end, I thought, huh, what would you say to someone who kind of shows you the mirror and says, well, clearly, it's kind of irresistible for you, too, to be part of the system that you so clearly condemn? It is a book about why it is irresistible and why yet it must be resisted. And I, I, I say in the book, the best way to know about a problem is to be part of it. You know, I don't think it was possible um, to, you know, live in the Florentine Renaissance and be not complicit in the world the Medici's were trying to run. That's the point. And that, it was my exposure to it and my complicity in it. Um, my having those moments, which I describe in the book, where there is a little bit of gentle, unspoken pressure to change what you're saying at an event mm -hmm because one thing will go down a little bit easier on the powerful than the other. Where you are working at a place because you are persuaded by what turns out to be a phony notion that you have to first apprentice in the tools of oppression to be able to dismantle it. Um, I felt so many of those things. And I felt that I, like so many people, had been indoctrinated in a phony religion. And what I tried to do in writing the book was write my way out of it. And I continue to try to write my way out of it. And what I have found to my great joy over the last year is so many other people who are, are in their own way trying to write their way out of it. Because the one thing I think most of us have in common right now is, that a, desire, is a desire to live in a societies that are really different than our societies are right now. Um, and, and I thought, I want to tell that story. Thank you for telling it. Thank you so much. Anand Girdadas. Thank you.